Hi, this is Paul Johnson with The Optimistic American. My guest today is Dr. Emily Basha. We're going to deal with questions about how agency and authoritarianism relate to leadership. On leadership, the big questions are, how is it that we can master our emotions so that we can be better leaders? What is the psychology behind leadership? And what are the tactical things that you can do to make yourself a better leader? Join us on the show today. I think you're going to enjoy it. Dr. Basha has some great psychological insights. And we appreciate you being with us here today. Also, if you can, make sure that you press that subscribe button. We won't send you a bunch of crazy emails or anything else. It just helps us continue on with our work. Now with Dr. Basha. Dr. Basha, welcome to the Optimistic American Show. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Paul. All right. So we've had some, uh, we have some great guests coming on the show over the next uh, couple of weeks. Obviously, um, our big focus on agency versus authoritarianism mm -hmm. is something that we want to not only try to focus on as part of this season, uh, because it relates to the book that we've written, which is Addictive Ideologies, but also because uh, we believe that's the big challenge that we face today. Now, we have on our show uh, one of our very first guests is Maria Yovanovitch. She's going to be talking about what is happening in Russia. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the real question that exists is whether or not Western NATO and Western democracy leadership is going to be able to rise up to the threat that we're seeing from him. We have Michael Beckley, Professor Michael Beckley, who is coming on, that is going to talk about the China threat. Um, and with both of those together, it's really clear we're, we're entering into a new Cold War. It's a very different Cold War than the ones in the past, but it clearly will be a challenge to Americans. And then we're going to have a number of guests that are going to talk about what's happening here at home. And that really is what addictive ideologies is about. It's about the issue of people gaining control over their own sense of agency uh, so that the authoritarian forces that exist here at home by the extremes that exist on both ends of our polar divide aren't the ones who are able to dominate. Now, understanding that that's true, one of the things that I think we need to focus on is leadership. Uh, there's a real dearth of leadership inside this country and everything from uh, how, we're, uh, how we work as leaders in our companies, how we work in leaders politically or socially, uh, and sometimes how we work as leaders in our family. But yet there are some great examples out there for us to follow. So my goal today is to try to talk about that very issue, leadership. Yeah, that's very powerful. You know, I see in my clinical practice, people want um, models out there that are going to inspire them and give them hope and give them something to look forward to. So when you were just talking about all of that introduction, I mean, there was a whole vacillation of emotions that were happening inside of me, like terror, threat management, um, some anxiety, thinking about, wait, what do you mean Cold War is happening? Um, you know, you're, you're bursting my bubble of delusion that is making me feel very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what do we do with those emotions? And so I see that people are really wanting leadership that they can aspire towards that are going to model for them, uh, a humanity that they want to raise their children in. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's, it is bleak. And, and I think it is something that's lacking, but yet it exists. And so how do, we, how do we find that and search for that? How do we encourage people to still have that hope and optimism? Um, and most importantly, where are those leaders? And mm -hmm. I, I think they're there. It's you know, just a matter of identifying I, them. I think oftentimes when we talk about the need for leadership, we're talking about someone else, mm -hmm. how someone else needs to step up and mm -hmm. be a leader. I, I hope what this show does is mm -hmm. when we're talking about the psychology of leadership, how can you step up? How can each of us step up mm -hmm. to be a better leader in the different roles that we play? Leaderships are, there are learned skills that are behind them. Now, one of the learned skills to leadership is this whole concept of optimism. I, I spoke to you a moment ago about a new Cold War. I think that that's mm -hmm. just simply a reality. Many people will listen to that and say, well, then why are you optimistic? 
Mm -hmm. well, I'm optimistic because look around you. Or what gives you the right, right? to be optimistic? Right? Take a look around you at the entrepreneurs, at the mm -hmm. uh, at the great things that we have that's that are going on in this country, at the invention, about the progress that we've made on um, on on uh, issues that affect real human beings, on what we've done on civil rights, equal rights, human rights. There's lots of reasons to be optimistic, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that you ignore problems. A good leader has to be a mixture of both. They have to, on one hand, be uh, be realistic about the things that are happening, understand the events that are taking place around them, and then at the same time, optimistic about our ability to be able to resolve them. All of our problems, they never get resolved unless you have people who believe that you can. Yeah, and I think, you know, to, to be the devil's advocate, but... Um thinking about what others are saying and how discouraged they are in their sentiments that I that I tend to hear from my client population is people are very self-serving and they're only looking out for themselves. They're only driven into power positions because they want power. And so as you were saying by the definition of leadership, I would define that as somebody who is a visionary, somebody who can mobilize people and motivate them, influence them, but to a cause that's bigger than themselves and not purely self-serving. Mm -hmm. It's okay that it does serve you in some way, but there has to be some level of selflessness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when I think of leadership, um, and by the way, I see that very difference very different than wanting to acquire power. Mm -hmm. um, wanting to acquire power usually is narcissistic in itself. Yeah, wealth, um, fame. Mm -hmm. And 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 generally, I have not found that they they really didn't make people happy. Uh, you know, I, I love the line by John D. Rockefeller. He had made hundreds of millions of dollars. He was one of the he was the richest man in the world. And somebody asked him a question, uh, "Well, how much more do you need?" And he said, "He thought about it for a second. He said, just a little bit more." He had a nervous breakdown after that, mm -hmm. right? It, it was it was driving him too far. That's not the same thing as leadership. Mm -hmm. Leadership, the very first definition of leadership, in my opinion, is the ability to influence other people. Mm -hmm. Now, if you you can be a leader for self-serving reasons, no doubt about that. You can be a leader that says the only thing I'm trying to lead for is to make certain that I get power or that I make more money. But the great leaders. The people that we look back on and admire in our families and in our communities and, and nationally are the people who were leading for a greater cause. You know, you can do that. You can do that as president of the United States if you believe that you're trying to help push for greater democracy around the world. You can do that as a family member by saying, hey, my goal as a father or mother is trying to make certain that my child has a, a better opportunity than I had. Those are those are those are both causes greater than yourself, and you need leadership to be able to execute on them. You know, I'm going to call you out for a second here. In our last episode that we just um, taped, you referred twice to our book as my book, mm -hmm. and it bothered me. And I thought, no. And when I thought about it later, I thought, well, no, this is how you are approaching it. This is how you've always approached this book. Um, that it's my family's stories that you're helping to amplify. Um, and, and I'm so grateful that you're doing it. And, you know, we can, I can see you as selflessly giving this gift to my family and to myself. And I'm so grateful for that. And that is a model, an example of true leadership. And I know right, for well, you. So let me just kind of hit on that for a second. Thank you. That's, that's very kind. Um, you know, you, you're, you divide your life up into parts, mm -hmm. right? There was a part when I was in my 20s and 30s. I became mayor at 29, 30 years old. I was on the council at mm -hmm. 25 years old. Um, I was incredibly ambitious. Now, I haven't lost that ambition completely. I'm mm -hmm. still at 63 years old. I can barely keep ambitious. up with you, and I'm 20 years older. It has nothing to do okay. with age. So I'm, I'm ambitious. <laughs> but, but I also really care about what I'm leaving behind. Right, I care about, and that's what you're driven by. And and so mm -hmm. the, the the show that we're doing on leadership today, mm -hmm. um, I really believe that we need to encourage people to be better leaders in our community, and and that's what this show's about. It's about trying to help other people accomplish that. 
and to I, show them the path. I enjoyed helping you on your book. I enjoyed being our. Oh, I enjoyed helping you on. <laughs> I will continue to correct <laughs> on our you. Book. <laughs> but but the, but the greatest honor was helping you do something where you could take your ideas on psychology, your what happened to you in your with your family history by the bath party. Um, terrorizing and murdering some of your family members to put that into some type of context that matters today. It was fun to be able to have my political skills, my historical skills, um, to be able to learn from you about psychology. And I learned a lot about going through the process, trying to just understand what really was happening then and to relate it to today. But the greatest part for me was being able to help you. Right? And, and that to me is when a leader is looking at that, when they're looking at what am I doing to promote a greater cause, that gives you a chance to be a greater leader, to think mm -hmm. about people other than yourself. Now, my, my next you. question, thank well, you, Paul. thank you. Um, tell me, what do you think are the basic components of leadership? Not the definition of leadership, but what are the components that make up leadership itself? Well, I would say probably 50% is really understanding and knowing yourself and being able to master your emotions, um, having that sense of self-agency again. And within that, I would say is social and emotional intelligence. Um, I then probably say about 40% is really understanding psychology, understanding human behavior, um, how other people think, feel, um, perceive in a, in a way that's different from your own and being able to step outside that yourself. It takes us back to, to what we that. spoke about last time, which is the theory of self. The theory of mind. Theory of mind, exactly. excuse me. Thank Correct. you. Um, and then 10%, which is just such a small amount, is really based on skill set. And I think people overestimate or may even become. Um, uh, less confident or feel more insecure if they feel like, oh, I know I don't have the skill set that's really demanding of me in this situation or cause. And um, they'll they'll even like self-oppress themselves. Mm -hmm. And really, when you're looking at it, it's probably only 10% is really based mm -hmm. on that skill set. Yeah, you know, I see the skill sets as hygiene, right? Mm -hmm. you, you have to have the basic hygiene to be mm -hmm. able to be successful. If you're going to be, uh, if you're going to be trading stocks, you need to have a license mm -hmm. and you need to know what the law is and you need to know mm -hmm. what the fund fundamentals of the marketplace is. But that's not the same thing as leading people. You're right. I, I see the skill sets as only being 10%. Um, I, I do believe a big, big portion, as, I, as you heard in my definition, my number one definition for leadership by itself is the ability to influence other people. Now, again, you become great when you decide that you're trying to influence other people for a greater cause than yourself. But you can't do any of that, as you said, without understanding agency, without understanding first and foremost, who are you? What, what are the factors that are driving you internally and having control over yourself? Mastering your emotions is a key factor. You know, when we talk about agency, we always like to talk about this amygdala hijack concept. The concept that people on the outside can appeal, uh, appeal to your negative bias. And when they do that, it hits the amygdala, and that puts you into the fight-or-flight mode. That fight-or-flight mode begins to, it begins to hijack the neocortex, where your rational thought comes from, where your optimism comes from. You have to gain control of that. You have to master that. So let's talk about that for a moment. If we can, um, I know one of the the issues that when we're talking about mastering your own emotions is the whole idea of locus of control. Can you talk about that concept for me? Yeah, so it's really fascinating. So locus of control is really looking at how do you attribute your successes and your failures? Do you inherently go to, well, it's something about me um, it's, if I failed or if I succeeded, then that has to do with either my character, my personality, my hard work, my ethic, um, or do you place it on something outside of yourself? Um, and that might be, well, no, it was the community or it was my family members who supported me. I wouldn't have all these successes if it wasn't for all of them. Um, or their failures. Well, no, it was my team member who 
you know, failed to do their part of their job. And so now I'm here and I ended up having to shoulder more work because they're a social loafer and I'm not. And that's why we failed, because I couldn't rely on on my team member or my company um, and or I had, I have bad leadership in my company or I have a manager who only is out to think for themselves um, or I feel scapegoated at my work or with my friend base. Um, so if you're externalizing blame or externalizing the responsibility, same thing, right? It, for If you're attributing your successes to um, what other people have contributed, not necessarily yourself, you're, you're placing that power outside of yourself. Now, it can get very complicated, and I'm trying to simplify this, but, you know, there can be some cultural differences. There are some studies that show there might be some gender differences. Um, and there are other studies that say, you know, not all people are just one or the other. We kind of blend and flow from one state to another state, kind of depending on the situation. So knowing that about yourself, it's important to pay attention. What, what kind of person am I? Do I tend to internalize failure or do I externalize that? Um, do I tend to, when somebody gives me a compliment, do I shift that compliment outside of myself or do I really take that in and feel good about myself when I feel it? Uh, and it's important for leaders uh, to also be paying attention to their employees or um, to other people on their team that they're working with. Uh, what kind of locus of control or worldview do they have? Because people operate from different paradigms. And so knowing that as a leader, as a manager, is important. How does that play into your clients, whether they be people who are in prison or terrorists that you've interviewed, or just people, regular people who come in for clinical help? How, how do, when you're, you're giving advice from a therapy standpoint, how does that come into play? What are you looking for? So the problems, I, I tend to look at where are the presenting problems and what are the issues and what are the patterns and the habits that people have perpetuated over time to keep themselves there. Uh, so I'll give you a couple examples that are problematic of both types. So people who come in and they're externalizers, so they tend to place all the responsibility and the, play, the blame and the power outside themselves tend to feel more helpless because they don't see that they could actually really affect much change themselves. They don't see themselves as having much control or power in a given situation. So because they feel so helpless, they really just come in and and will talk badly about this person and that person and this person and how they they hurt them and how they got them into this situation. And if it wasn't for all these other people, they wouldn't be in this situation. It's a miserable existence because you're, you're trapped. You see no way out. On the other side, the people who tend to have more of that internalized locus of control, well, when failure hits, they tend to internalize it so much. And so especially if they're perfectionistic, um, they really take failure hard. Um, th they might be more driven uh, they might take more risks, um, but they tend to do it alone, uh, and and they can really run themselves down. And sometimes they take blame for things that are really not for them to take blame. Okay, over. this is interesting because so it's this is counter, counter to my upbringing. This last part, um, right? I know you struggle with this part. <laughs> exactly. so, so I have to tell I've you got kind of great how I see examples. It. <laughs> So, <laughs> so, so the psychology of Paul Johnson my, today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's try to avoid that. So in any event, the uh, my father used to always say, boy, it's your fault. And, and he'd say, uh -huh. look, if it's not your fault, then there's nothing you can do about it. He uh -huh. said, so take joy in it being your fault. Yeah. Because if it's your fault, you can fix it. It and, is so ingrained in you. <laughs> and and, and yeah. I don't but I don't get stressed by it. I don't I don't get upset by the fact that I take You're more stressed if you don't oh, have absolutely. the control. You'd rather it, take the blame and have the control rather than than giving part look, of it if away. If I learned anything okay. in politics, it, it's this. 
don't worry about what other people think about you. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you need the basics. Again, hygiene, you know, make certain. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I've done this, gone on camera with my hair sticking up straight in the back. I, I've done so many embarrassing things on camera, I can't even hardly begin to tell you. <laughs> you need the basics. You need to have some concern about how other people see you. But the fact that you fail, if you, to me, if you drive your life by saying, well, I don't want to go run for this office because if I fail, what will people think about me? I don't want to go start this business because if I fail, what will people think about me? Th those are things you do for yourself. And, and if you're doing it for someone else in the first place, it was a bad idea. If you're running for office because you think other people want you to, don't do it. But if you want to, so what if you fail? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what other people think. It matters what did you learn? What did you gain? What experiences did you get? What, what stories are you going to be able to tell about what it was that happened? How can you use that to take your future to the next place? And, and I believe me on this. You learn as much running for office and mm -hmm. losing mm -hmm. as you learn in winning. It's the same as true in business. Probably you learn more from losing because most people pay attention to that. But I never. More. I, I, the only part that hurt me mm -hmm. when I lost was how bad the people around me were hurt. I mean, I began Who to realize you that and helped you campaign that it meant a lot to them. Donated, right? They, they, they worked hard. They put a lot of effort into mm -hmm. it. To me, it was fun and enjoyable. And then when I would see how depressed they were mm -hmm. at the end, that would have an effect on me because nobody wants to let other people down. But and but you felt responsible in some I way. I felt responsible for them. For I went their around emotions. And made they all got jobs. And I, <laughs> I followed up on their lives and so did this it. this is where, right? <laughs> this is where Paul Johnson exists in a vacuum and then uh, the other people in kind of a normal average range <laughs> exist so, outside of that. So in your <laughs> mind, where's the perfect ground for someone? If it's not, if it's not great well, for them to be in a position where they blame themselves, but also not in a great position where they blame other people, where's the perfect place for someone to find agency? So I'm going to give a, a very psychology-related answer to this. <laughs> so, you know, it's about looking for the dysfunction, you know, and look for the impairment. If there isn't necessarily an impairment or dysfunction, it might not necessarily be all bad. And, you know, I tell people who are – I told one of my clients the other day who, who tends to have more of a depressive – fatalistic, future-oriented paradigm, to have a healthy dose of narcissism. I'm like, I want you to have a healthy dose of nar narcissism for as a protective shield. You know, but, but if I'm telling that to a client who maybe has, who's too egocentric, and I want them to feel more connected to people and other people's states of minds and their emotions, I, I'm not going to give them that same recipe. Oh. All right. So I've heard you relate that to CBT. Help me understand how that relates to CBT. Yeah, absolutely. So Aaron Beck was the the father and, and founder and developer of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and he followed in suit after Albert Ellis had created uh, rational emotive therapies. Um, and he was really looking to simplify and understand how does a person's emotional state influence their behaviors and their thinking patterns? And how do we take a person who's suffering from depression and anxiety and get them to think about it in a more rational or practical or factually based way rather than allowing themselves to be controlled by some maladaptive cognitions that are keeping them stuck in depression and anxiety. Um, you know, today I just want to say I was doing some research for this podcast and I saw, I mean, there's so many self-help things available and that are accessible, which is a wonderful thing, but I, I think CBT is so oversimplified. It really has a deeper, richer theoretical foundation, which again ties into what we're saying about um, uncovering your inner truths. Nobody can do this work for you. Uh, and you have to be able to go deeper. So it's not just about uncovering your automatic thoughts and changing your emotion and voila, you know, you're magically no longer depressed, you're magically no longer socially anxious and you could overcome almost any obstacle, you have to go deeper. And, and that's about uncovering 
your assumptions about the world. We were talking about paradigms earlier and perspectives and how people can exploit that or um, authoritarian governments can exploit that or other, other people around you can. But you have to know what you're operating on. So there are some specific things that you can do is you need to look for patterns, be a pattern seeker. And with cognitive behavioral therapy, they say you, you must journal in order to be able to uncover some of these patterns or um, otherwise it's really going to be hard to elucidate. Uh, but you want to look at what kinds of rules do you operate on? How do you see the future? How do you see yourself? How do you look at others? How do you define others? Um, and what are some of the core beliefs that are driving your assumptions? So usually these will be if-then statements. If this, then what? You know, what are your predictions about what might happen? So for instance, um, I'll, I'll pull out maybe a, a typical example. Um, if I'm a person that has been, say, hurt in a lot of past intimate relationships and um, say that my, my upbringing and my childhood um, was a very unstable home, um, maybe there was alcoholism or maybe there was domestic violence or um, maybe I was moving from lots of different households and there was a lot of instability. Relationships were modeled to me as, as being untrustworthy. Um, people were threatening. Um, people were hostile. And so I'll be less likely to want to open myself up in those relationships, especially if I've had numerous unsuccessful and violent, unhealthy relationships. Um, and so underneath that all, I might have assumptions of if I were to expose myself in an intimate relationship, that would be all bad because that, that would end up with me being alone and rejected. Um, and if I were to ask myself, well, if that were true, what would that say about me? Well, that might mean that people won't love me if they really knew who I was, if I were to open myself up, because that's been my experience in the past. Then the psychologist would ask, well, if that were true, what would that mean about you personally? And then I would say, well, I'm unlovable or I'm not worthy of love. And if I truly believe that about myself, I'm going to sabotage every opportunity there is for me to have a healthy, loving, Because you know it's going to fail in the end anyway. And I might even want to prove to myself that it's true because my past has taught me that. Mm -hmm. And so when we filter down um, from the foundation of that, that's why I'm saying we need to uncover those behavioral patterns and the emotional patterns. Some of the um, cognitive distortions that we operate on might be magnif magnification or catastrophizing or minimizing some things over here or maybe overthinking or fortune telling um, or we discount the positives. Uh, these are some of the, the typical common traps. Uh, emotional reasoning. So if I if I feel helpless or hopeless and I'm pessimistic about future relationships, I'm not really going to give it my all. You know, I'll put my pretend person out there um, because I know that's maybe what people are drawn to, um, but I'm never really going to show them myself. So I'll never really have the true experience of being loved for my ugly, you know, for my uglier sides. Mm -hmm. Who's going to validate that? If they're if I only get the experience of them loving me when I'm perfect, when I'm pretty, when I'm thin, when I'm all of these other things, well, then you're constantly going to be striving for this thing that isn't really inherently, truly, deeply, profoundly you. You know, I, um, I'm not sure that this was cognitive behavioral therapy, but uh, we had a counselor. Uh, I've, I've spent lots of times with lots of different experts on leadership. And one of the uh, processes that they gave us was that, you know, you start by taking something that happens in your life that might be extreme. Mm -hmm. um, and first you write out exactly what happened. You write out the details of what happened. Then you write out 
the what if. That's what when you said the what if, that's what sparked us. What is this going to mean? What's going to happen? Uh, my relationship's going to fall apart. My company's going to fall apart. Uh, the uh, my life is going to be over. Uh, I'm going to lose all faith in the community. Whatever it is, you write it out. And then what you do is you think about, okay, now what would someone else tell me that was trying to take me off of that ledge? Yes, and that's, so a good, that's a good tactic. You yeah. write out then what they would tell me uh-huh. if uh, to tell me why this wasn't going to happen. And then write out one more time, now what do you think is going to happen? Mm-hmm. Right, Because you started with this, this catastrophe in the beginning, mm-hmm. and then you thought about what someone else would have told you. And almost always people on their own will come to a much more balanced place. But that first position they had, if it just stays in their head, they're going to be stressed. Yes. They're going to be really stressed. And then the last thing they said is to keep that so that over time you can look back on it and say, hey, how do these things that I keep doing when I get to this stage, where are the patterns? What keeps happening? Is that fall in the line of CBT? Spoken like a true psychologist. Well, I, I, I'm very I'm impressed, Paul. <laughs> yes, I just work absolutely. on leadership. Absolutely. So, uh, so, and they did a good job teaching you, and you did a great job teaching it. Um, so that's exactly what you want to do. So you want to shift your perspective, and that's then going to sh- change your emotions, how you're going to feel about the, any given situation, and it's going to cause you to do things differently. And that's what we want to do. Um, So there's a great quote that, uh, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different outcome. Mm -hmm. We are creatures of habit. And as much as we complain about wanting things in our life to be different, we are those agents of change. And, and it, it's hard to do it on your own. This is when, you know, talking to someone you trust, getting a mentor, a spiritual leader, um, uh, surrounding yourself by people that you want to model after. It doesn't necessarily have to be in therapy, um, but it can be. But this is where you can get the help to start creating those shifts in your life. Once you start getting the ripple effects, then the momentum, you can get, carry that forward. But going back to just what you were describing, what I often will tell my clients is, I want you to journal a few things. Your automatic thoughts, the emotions that you're experiencing, your body sensations, um, and your actions. And do that several times throughout the day. It could be when you remember to do so because something pertinent just happened. But oftentimes the mind will cycle through so many different automatic thoughts and beliefs. And what you want to do, as you were just explaining, you can think about somebody else. How might they think about this situation differently? How might my psychologist think about this situation differently? What are some of my incorrect assumptions that I'm making about this situation that is keeping me stuck and not being able to see all my options? Now, once you start doing that shift in perspective taking and you're starting to look at things slightly differently, you can have some reformulated and reconstructed beliefs. And then what you do is now look at your emotions. So before you said anxiety was like 80%. Um, now what is, how, how anxious are you feeling about this situation now that you started to restructure some of your thoughts about I this actually situation? actually apply a number to it. Apply a percentage to it so you can see, and it's some feedback for yourself that, wow, I actually was able to lower my anxiety level all through thinking differently about this situation. All right, Emily. So we're going to come back uh, to how do you manage the stress? How do you master your own emotions? But I want to talk now, I want to transition somewhat into the psychology of uh, the psychology of leadership, meaning how do we influence other people? Uh, how do we make certain that we were able to influence them in a way in which we, we need to to be able to get something done? Yes. Yeah. And that takes us to the psychology of leaders. And I know that you've had a lot of experience in training yourself personally, but also encountered many different kinds of leaders in many different kinds of positions. So what are the different kinds of leaders leadership? Well, you know, before I go into that, let me just say this. Um, 
you will hear people talk about styles of leadership all the time. The, 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 I'm, I'm a big fan of Tony Robbins. He likes talking about servant leadership, which I, I love the idea of servant leadership. I think it's a great concept. But, but I can tell you there are different styles of leadership that I've seen in different people, and all of them have been successful, and all of them have failed. Right? So I tend to think that you should pick different types of leaderships for different types of situations. Now, the, you know, if I were to go into the different leadership types, I'd start with uh, the coach. Right? So the coach is someone who will help you get better at what it is that you want to get better at. And they'll, they'll, they'll help you utilize those inner skill sets that you have, those inner desires that you have, to be able to promote you to a new level. They rarely are telling you what to do. They're rarely taking the position of what's necessary. They're instead just helping you along the way. Now, that's very indifferent to a visionary leader. A visionary leader, probably a great example of a visionary leader would be Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. Steve Jobs was driven by the ideal. He had the ideal of what it was that he wanted to accomplish. It was so ideal, it was unreal. Mm -hmm. He was driving towards something that, that most people just thought you couldn't accomplish. If you weren't willing to stay with him on that, you needed to leave or you were going to get fired. And you needed to do it his way. He was unempathetic to people who were below him. That style in that particular place can be very effective and very successful. I doubt that it's going to be successful in a marriage. In fact, it wasn't for him in a marriage. It's probably going to be a failure utilizing that leadership style in a variety of other places. But for Apple, it was a great place. There's autocratic. Autocratic isn't necessarily leadership. It's I'm in charge. We're going to do what I want. It's going to start at the top, and you need to understand what it is that I want. You need to get it done. Autocratic can really be helpful in, ser in places of crisis um, because sometimes you need people to follow. You're, you're in a crisis, and you need to get things done. There's bureaucratic, and uh, you know I spent time in politics, and a lot of people hate bureaucratic, but I can promise you there are some great people who operate in bureaucratic environments and do really well. In a bureaucratic environment, what's fascinating about it is in usually in business, the single most important thing is efficiency. How are we very efficient at getting something done? In a bureaucratic environment, fairness is usually more important. There are rules to ensure that you're being fair, which oftentimes can be very inefficient. Now, when I was mayor, I contracted out our garbage service. In fact, I split the city up into four areas. Well, uh, some mayors before me actually had been engaged in doing that. But the point was, we separated up the city. We then had the private sector and public sector bid against one another. And we tried to remove that from the bureaucratic maze because we recognized that it was a service and that it just needed to be efficient in terms of what we were delivering. But there were other areas where being more bureaucratic was important. As an example, uh, the fire department. You don't want the fire department showing up to deliver service based upon who paid the most taxes. That mm -hmm. might be efficient. It might be fair from a from a tax standpoint, but it's not going to be fair to people whose homes are burning down in low-income neighborhoods, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So bureaucratic plays a role. Uh, there's also um, uh, there's hands-off. Uh, there's democratic. Democratic includes lots of other people. Um, Laissez-faire. I, I remember first time I heard laissez-faire, I was in high school. It was a very embarrassing moment. I, I stood up and I said, what? I said, the lazy fairy type government. What is <laughs> <It's> that? French. <laughs> laissez-faire. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I could have used you in high school. Anyway, the, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but that is one where, again, it's kind it's of more a, relaxed. It's mo much more relaxed. Attitude. Um, then you have, permissive. you have uh, pace setters, people who, they set the pace. They, mm -hmm. they, they work along with a larger group, but they drive the pace harder than anyone else inside of the, uh, the system itself. But all of those systems can be effective. They tend to be more effective in different types of situations, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so what I try to advise people is, that makes sense. look, study different leadership styles, mm -hmm. but then don't make one your default. Just think about what's the situation that I'm in and which which one of these traits would work better in this situation. And if you can pre-plan it, 
even better because there are times democratic leadership getting everybody to the same place at the exact same time can be the most productive and you get the most innovation from people hmm. because they feel that they can participate. There are other times of crisis where being autocratic probably is important. Now, I think you should still listen to other people, but you need to be able to make a decision and you need to be able to move it forward as fast as you Next can. swiftly. Right? And, and again, in a time of crisis, that matters. There are other times that it's great to be a coach. I mean, I would tell you what if I learned anything in being a parent, it's that, you know, when you when you have a small child, you're you're with them all the time. You're you're making certain they don't run out into the street, that they're getting their homework done, that they're if they're sick, that they're, you know, taking their medicine. You're doing all these things. And then one day, they can do it for themselves. Yeah. And and you still feel this inner desire to save them, to rescue them, to make certain <laughs> that it's going to be okay. But it doesn't work. They no longer need you at that no, point, right? <laughs> one of my favorite stories, my brother showed up at his, uh, at his college for his little girl. And uh, the college dean asked everybody, she said, okay. She said, we've got a real new technology. She said, it's a wonderful technology. She said, it will follow your child everywhere they go. In the hallways, in the classrooms, you'll know whether they're getting their homework done. You'll know uh, what's going on in the dorms. You will have 100% video access to everything they're doing. And then she says, now, who would want this program? She said, uh, my brother said a whole bunch of hands, including his one up in the air that he wanted that software. And she said, okay, you're sick. You need to let go. <laughs> this technology, if it does exist, it shouldn't exist, right? <laughs> There's it was no a trap. privacy. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, the, but the point is, you have to transition to being a coach. Mm -hmm. and, and in that type of leadership, it makes sense. And trusting is a big component of that, which I think a lot of people would really struggle with depending on their personality type, especially if they're driven towards leadership. All right. So let's go back to this whole concept of, uh, let's go back to this whole concept of stress. I know that you had uh, one last point that you wanted to make on that. Yeah, you know, another theme that I, I'm commonly seeing clinically is this need for power and control. And I think just going back to when I was talking about cognitive behavioral therapy and going back to the core beliefs, I think what's ultimately driving this need for people is that they're feeling powerless or that they have no control in their environment or their future or for themselves or for their family or for their livelihoods. Um, and we've been through a lot. There's been a lot of tremors that have happened globally and nationally, and people's lives are rapidly changing, and change does bring on stress, even if it's positive change, even if it's a marriage, even if it's a baby. It, it can be a wonderful thing if it's a, a promotion at your job um, or a new business that you're creating. Uh, if you're in an entrepreneur, there's they're stressful experiences. And, and again, thinking about how am I exercising this need for control excessively in my life that it's it's hurting me, it is harming me, and going back to where is the dysfunction. Sometimes people won't see that it's a dysfunction, or they might even negotiate with themselves, like, okay, well, if I, if I take more of a laissez-faire approach on this thing, then I'm going to amp up and be more, you know, dominating in this thing. And, uh, and so, you know, I'm seeing an increase also with eating disorders, um, with health concerns, uh, somatic, psychosomatic complaints that are ailing people's bodies, um, and the excessive need for control in their relationships. Um, and it's hurting them ultimately. Mm -hmm. And, and so I just want to encourage people to have that awareness and just think for a moment, how is this negatively affecting my life, this need for control? What am I doing that is really not serving me? We all have our blind spots, and it can be really, really hard to see them. But think about yourself throughout your day. Just, just take a, this moment, even right now, and think about, what am I stressing about that is really not worth me stressing over? 
but it's allowing me to have some degree of predictability and control to an obsessive degree that it helps me to feel somewhat less anxious. But it's really not about that situation. That is really in the minutia. It's more about something else that's bigger and it's outside of my control. And if I really allowed myself to be confronted by that, it's gonna shake my whole foundation and I'm not able to do that work right now. And it's okay to get to that place, but I'm saying allow yourself to shift and get to that place to identify what are you allowing yourself to live, what kind of illusion are you allowing yourself to live in, allow yourself to confront it and even to walk through that door and go to the next phase and the next level because it is demanding you to. And I see people driving themselves sick by trying to control things that are really a waste of their emotional and spiritual energy. Okay, so let's talk about this from a leadership standpoint. Um, meaning you're not the one that's having that stress, your employee is, or a community member is, or a constituent is. Um, how do you help them through it? Now, I'll give you what we, I do. I have kind of a process when I'll see people getting stuck. Um, I always start with the why. All right, why are we here? And of course, they'll give us some mediocre why. I go, no, 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 why am I here? Why are why is this company here? What is it that we're trying to accomplish? What What's our bigger goal? And once I get them to talk about the bigger goal, then I go back, I say, okay, now in terms of what you're dealing with, what's the one big thing that has to happen for us to get to our goal? And then they'll give me their one big thing. And then I'll say, okay, now what are you in control of mm -hmm. with that? All right, and they'll tell me what they have control. I'll say, all right, are there parts that other people have control over that we can help with? Because if, if it's you know, the, the general public's attitude, probably not. Right. But if it's the if it's yeah, if we could just get the police department or if we could get the marketing department, or if we get the sales department, if we get some other group to do X, then maybe we could have more success. OK, well, that takes us back to our one big thing. Maybe our one big thing is to try to get someone else to act in a certain way that we think that we can have influence over, not control over. Big difference between control and influence. And people confuse those all the time. You can't stress about control over someone else because you don't have it. They have control over themselves. What you may be able to do is to influence them. And in influencing them, you're rarely going to influence them by beating them up. You're going to influence them by doing the same thing, talking about what our big mission is, what our big goal is, what it is that we're trying to do to help people, and then telling them how it is that we'd like their help and engaging them in the process. But when you're advising, I know you have CEOs as clients, uh, but for that matter, if they're not CEOs, if they're just normal people, how do you advise them to deal with that type of a question? I think what I'm talking about, if I were to just trying to summarize it and capture it into a word, is existential crisis. We talked about it a few episodes ago. Mm -hmm. and And I think it's still bubbling up to the surface for a lot of people. And part of what you're describing is a solution, and it's about having shared meaning. It's about feeling like you belong to a community, a that you belong to a cause. And that helps, especially for a person going through an existential crisis. But at the same time, nobody can resolve that for the person. That person, nobody can do that work for me. Only I can do that work for me. Um, and it's an isolating process. You can still be with other people, and yet you're still alone. All right. So I'm going to shift subjects on you just a little bit. Um, one of the things that people stress a lot about is this whole idea of having to make a presentation, getting up in front of other people, especially from a leadership standpoint. In leadership, you have to make presentations to other people. You have to uh, stand in front of other people to try to convince them of what's necessary or what's right. Do you have any advice for that? So there's this really interesting study that came out a few years ago looking at the power position. And so they had different participants um, spend, it, what they're saying is if you spend two minutes in a strength 
producing stance or posture. So, you know, think about being superwoman or superman and um, taking up space, not not being small, um, standing up strongly, opening your chest, pulling your shoulders back, um, and speaking from a place of expertise and confidence and enthusiasm um, that people actually start to think and behave differently. All it took was two minutes for people to prime themselves into this um, this thought process. And they were actually going through some um, job interviews and they were being rated on their behavior. Uh, and the people who scored more highly were the ones who had spent this time in the power position. What is fascinating about this study is that for people who spent two minutes doing this power position before entering into an anxiety-provoking situation um, is that their testosterone levels increased by 20%. Their cortisol levels decreased by 18, 18%, which is their stress um, stress, wait, cortisol are stress releasing hormones. Um, and they were 33% more likely to take calculated risks. And that's just for two minutes. And that's just for taking, holding a strength inducing posture. Mm -hmm. So again, think about that power pose, mm -hmm. your superwoman or superman pose. There, there is no doubt about this. Your body affects your biology. Your biology affects your mind. Yes. Um, uh, a really fun speaker to listen to on leadership. You can listen to hundreds of uh, uh, his speeches online as Tony Robbins. Yes. Uh, and uh, I know that in one of the programs that I went to with Tony Robbins, he, he, he jumps, he bounces. You'll watch him just bounce, 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 bounce before he starts. I don't know how many times a day that guy jumps up and down, but it's a lot. And he's a big guy. And he's huge. <laughs> right, if you, if you, I'm six foot seven. I weigh about 240 pounds. And he, I don't know if he's taller than me, but he's bigger than me, just <laughs> solid. Um, he says that's to change the way his mind is thinking. It's to pump himself up. It's not just the audience. Yeah. He's trying to pump, pump himself up. up. So before, you know, I, I can tell you that uh, I usually, before a big speech, I'll go do a run. All right, I'll go do a workout. Because that workout, there's no doubt when you do a workout, it pumps up your testosterone. You can see it. But it also mm -hmm. relieves your stress. And it's this strange thing. You're, you get both sides of it yeah. at the same time. You feel more energetic. You feel more ready to go. Uh, and at the same time, you're less stressed about the fact that you're doing it. Mm -hmm. I also know using your hands helps you do the same thing. You know, at times I, you know, I, I have to be careful. Like I like sitting forward into a microphone. I, it helps me get excited. Sometimes I get a little too excited. I interrupt people too much. I do things that I shouldn't do. So every now and then I have to sit back in the chair and or make you knock sure. the microphone out. <laughs> That's right. But but the point is, mm -hmm. your body affects your biology. Yes. It, it has an effect, and that has an effect on your mind. Understanding that confidence. connection is key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your confidence, your enthusiasm, your excitement, your passion. Um, so they were looking at different studies, um, like venture capitalists who were more likely um, to sign up with something that they were being told, sold by a, a sales person. Um, and they said the people who were more passionate and more excited, more passionate and more excited and more confident um, were more likely to get the sale. Uh, so it works. And there is this feedback loop process because then you feel better about yourself. And you see that through your behavioral change, um, you do get that increased sense of self-esteem and confidence through the doing. Now, it's so interesting. So going back to locus of control, I think one of the things I failed to mention was um, people who tended to have an internalized locus of control where they see themselves as affecting, um, influencing their successes as well as uh, taking responsibility for failures, they tended to have a greater sense of self-efficacy, which is linked to self-esteem because they believe that they have the power to control and influence and affect change in their environment 
or change of events or influence others. And so thinking about combining that with this power pose, it's like, it's a great recipe. You know, and that also influences optimism and hopefulness. And again, that that sen- having that sense of power and control and ability to influence. Going back to leadership, leadership styles, I think an important part of being a good leader is being an active listener. Um, having a real deep, intuitive understanding of what other people are going through, what they're suffering, what they're motivated by, what they're stressed by. I see you asking people all the time, what excites you? What upsets you? What stresses you out? Mm -hmm. These are such important questions and it helps you to understand that person at a real deeper level. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, I think with active listening, it's important, especially for leaders, to pay attention to what they're saying. So it's not just about a monologue and you're giving direction and you're being the coach and advice, but you're summarizing. And you know, I encourage listeners to do this in their relationships. Provide a summary of what you just heard to the person. Let them know that you were listening and pause. Don't give an opinion, don't pass a judgment. Allow them to say, wow, yeah, you got it. You got it right. Or allow them to correct you and say, you know what, you missed an important part. Mm -hmm. Or no, that's not quite right. I do that with my clients all the time because I want to make sure I'm always striving to understand them. I never fully expect, and I do this in my relationship as well, and I never fully expect, nor do I want to feel like, oh, I know my partner 100%. I always want to be striving to learning them. Yeah, so that's in the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, a very good Mm -hmm. book. Uh, The way that he put it was, seek to understand before seeking to be understood. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the things that I use in this process is, um, especially in partnerships, and I I literally have hundreds of partnerships. Usually they're just, it's a single piece of real estate inside an Mm -hmm. LLC, but there are hundreds of those partnerships. Mm -hmm. Um, What I try to do is I try to go through uh, and get everybody on the same page on their tactics, on their strategy, on their vision, and on their values, and, and getting them to understand that those aren't the same thing. That you know, you may say, well, one of the things that we need to do is uh, we need to go build, uh, we need to build a wood frame construction project. Well, that's probably a, a tactic. The strategy might be, hey, we're going to go build homes. And the tactic is we're going to do those with wood frame. But then you get to the vision. Well, okay, you're going to build one home or hundreds of homes. You're going to sell them. You're going to rent them. Do you want to turn this into a business or just do a one-off deal? What, what's, the, what's the vision that you have? And then once you think about the vision, the strategy becomes a lot easier to try to implement. And then the tactics become easier under that. But the thing that people miss all the time is trying to figure out whether or not there's an alignment of values because values are, are a key in a partnership. Mm. I, I have found over time that I'm really not driven by money. That, that, that doesn't mean that, you know, that it's not important. If you don't have money, if you don't make money, whatever venture you're in, it won't be sustainable. And if you want something that lasts longer than you, it needs to make money. But that's not the thing that gets me out of bed. You know, for me, it's it's a concept of, am I changing the world? Am I thinking the unthinkable? And am I having fun? Am I enjoying what it is that I'm doing? That, those, that That's my mantra, and it's, it's key to me, and I apply it to every deal. But I'll try to listen to my other partners to figure out what their values are. Because if their value is, hey, I just want to make money, that's not a bad value. There's nothing wrong with it. It just doesn't really line up with mine, mm-hmm. right? And and we're going to end up being unhappy because we're going to get to the end and we're going to have a very different idea of what needs to happen, how the strategy should unfold, because we didn't have alignment on the value. Mm-hmm. And so usually what I'll do is I'll go up. By the way, this was taught to me by one of my partners in business. He's, uh, he's really good at, uh, at thinking about leadership amongst people. He runs a healthcare company with me. Actually, he runs it. He and I were co-founders, but nonetheless, um, the idea that you sit down and you have people list things, and then you'll start to ask them, is that really a tactic? Is that a strategy? Is that the vision? Or is that a value? Mm -hmm. Because values are very, very high level. And once you get people to align values, 
all the rest of it becomes easier. So let's talk about some of the things that, uh, that people need to learn uh, to be able to be successful. Certainly, they need to learn to have a vision. They need to learn how to have values. And they need to learn how to, uh, they need to learn different styles of leadership. Yeah. And so learning to have a vision, it goes back to what we were talking about, about what is your meaning and purpose? Um, What is it that drives you? And being able to uncover that and ask yourself those deeper philosophical questions and looking back at your life is really going to help you identify that. Mm -hmm. Learning to uh, influence other people, that obviously starts with Uh, seeking to understand before seeking to be understood, but becoming a master of that, which you can't do unless you've mastered your own emotions first. Yeah, and learning to influence others through either being a coach or being a guide or being an active listener, um, but again, through leadership properties. So thinking about how you can start to exercise this in your day-to-day life. Mm -hmm. Uh, Learning to deal with disappointment um, and failure. There's just little doubt that uh, disappointment and failure is going to happen. You know, in business, most specifically in business, I would tell people, do your best not to take it personal and to just, if if you had a longer vision for what you were going to do, it, it rarely has such a big effect. But that ability to make certain that you can put things in perspective, I think are exceptionally important. Yeah, and taking care of your body because your body becomes that tool. So just as we were talking about that power position and how that influences the hormone secretions in your body, a testosterone and, um, and also lower your cortisol levels, um, all of that is going to be really important. So, so thinking about protecting and preserving your body, but also how you can use your body. You know, that putting things in perspective, I'm going to go back to that just for a mm-hmm. second. Um, you know, I, I, we, we see people in the United States today. I can't tell you how many people I have who will go online uh, and they will put up things like, what is there to be optimistic about? And they paint these very, very dire uh, scenarios of what's going on in the world. Now, obviously, I, I don't know what's going on in their life. I don't know the, the challenges and the troubles that they're facing. Sometimes I feel really bad for them when I'm reading them to, to wonder what it is that's, that's led them to such mm-hmm. a position. But I do believe that putting things in perspective is important. You know, I, I grew up in a very poor neighborhood. My, my mom was a waitress. My dad was a construction worker. But we had a family. We had nine kids in our family and then nine double cousins that live right down the street from us. We stuck together. Uh, Even in very bad times, we'd go in the backyard and Uncle Buddy would play the guitar. Many other kids in our neighborhood didn't have that. They, they grew up in they grew up in very very tough conditions in fact four of my five best friends died violent deaths mostly related to drugs um, so it became obvious to be able to to see that I had a lot to be grateful for a lot to be happy about you know when we we hear people talk about in the United States how you know they, they like to complain about the one percent or the, mm-hmm. the the big earners in society or Wall Street or other groups I'm gonna drink my coffee as you're saying <laughs> that's that right. from Starbucks you know, <laughs> I mean when when you when you realize <laughs> the average person makes about five dollars and fifty cents mm-hmm. a day cost of a coffee right uh-huh. there and most of us are buying a cup of coffee for about that same price that in fact mm-hmm. if you're making minimum wage in the United States you're in about the top 30 percent of the world mm-hmm. Keeping things in perspective is important. That doesn't mean that we can't do better. That doesn't mean that that you shouldn't do better than a minimum wage job. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't have education. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to create more opportunities. But it does mean Mm -hmm. that by putting things in perspective and becoming grateful, your your ability to become more uh, optimistic and to see the opportunities dramatically increases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I... You, you know, you say it so well. It's so true. You know, we, we do live privileged lives. I know it, it sounds cliche, um, but even thinking, you know, I traveled in Africa and I remember seeing the effects of malnutrition, like real malnutrition on babies. Mm-hmm. And it's horrifying. Um, and no one should ever, ever have to live through that or experience that. And there's so much abundance in the world that no, I don't care what child and where you are and what part of the world you live in, that, that there's just really no reason or rationale or explanation for it. Mm-hmm. 
Paul, you work with so many different kinds of people of all ages and uh, across varied lifespans. Um, and I was just interested in asking about your experience with millennials. So how do you translate these teachings for just them? Just like a millennial to ask about millennials. <laughs> <laughs> I get I think it. I'm a little older than a millennial. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know. They're coming in on 40. But the, um, well, I have, um, I have hundreds of young people who work for me that are millennials. Uh, our healthcare company employs uh, a number of people who I'd say are between the ages of about 20 years old to 40 years old. Um, you know, here's what I would tell you first. Um, I, I think we can be very encouraged by them. Uh, for the, their leadership skills, they're different. They're not the same as, as you, or at least as me. Um, they're much more concerned about the community and about other people. They're a little bit more collectivist than I am, but that's not altogether a bad thing. In fact, there are many good traits that come from that. They're also very eager to learn and they do care about individualism. They do care about the rights and liberties that we've been given in the country. Sometimes I worry about them being able to speak up in situations where um, where you know political correctness takes place, they become mm -hmm. afraid to deal with this minority who becomes a very loud minority, and they they just simply don't want to offend them or others. I, I do think well, that that's an important. That's right. Mm -hmm. But but at the at the end of the day, first boomers should be very happy they exist because mm -hmm. boomers are beginning to retire, and it's going to be millennials that are going to pay their wages. Mm -hmm. I think I really do believe this. They they will end up proving to be our greatest generation. Mm. They're the group of people that we're not only going to rely on demographically to be able to pay for our retirements, mm -hmm. but they're also the people who are going to innovate our way out of a lot of problems mm. that exist in the world. Uh, I'm very optimistic about them. Mainly, I'm optimistic from just the young people I've seen in our companies and in the college campuses that I've gone out to speak to. Um, I do think that we have a bright future in front of us. While I know we have some challenges, I know that we have to provide better leadership. I think that we can be encouraged by what is yet to come. So, Emily, thank you very much for being on the show. Thank and, you, Paul. Uh, we'll see you in the next uh, episode. Always a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for joining the Optimistic American Show. Now, help us grow by subscribing to our channel. If you enjoyed the episode, please leave a like and a comment. There is so much more that we have planned, and we can't wait for you to embark upon this journey with us.